Hello there. This is Uncle Johnny, old Diablo, with another video about engine technology theory, etc., etc. Hope my phone don't fall over. It's been doing that lately. Uh, since I'm doing things a little bit different on uh, YouTube, what I originally intended to do. Let's get started. Now, I made a couple videos before about Detroit diesels. And I talked some about Cummins and Cat and everything. Uh, and the laws of physics and how they apply to everything. It's one of the first things when I went to Max A's vocational school in Cleveland, Ohio. They always teach you the basics. You have to have a good basic fundamental knowledge. Why things happen. Why, why engines do what they do. There are many variables in engines. There are variables and constants. And these are engineering terms. Now, a variable is fuel pressure. On a Cummins PT fuel injection system, the plunger, other than wear, doesn't change. And the stroke doesn't change unless, of course, the cam wears. What does change is the fuel pressure going past a metered orifice in a specific amount of time, which also changes. And that is what determines how much fuel will get into the cup. But the stroke and the bore diameter, short of damage or wear, those are considered constants. The pressure and time, PT, are the variables. In a Detroit, the plunger on a unit injector, and unit injectors are very good injectors. High pressure unit injectors are very good injectors, very respectable mechanical injectors. They actually had a stainless steel ring around the barrel assembly and the outlet port in the barrel assembly at the end of the injection stroke, which was uncovered to bleed off the high pressure fuel to stop injection, actually come out at an angle and spun the stainless steel sleeve so that it would distribute the wear over a long period of time and not just hit the same spot. Very innovative, very ingenious. Uh, since we're talking about Detroit injectors just for a second, they are rebuildable and you get a new plunger, a new spring, and a new barrel assembly and usually a new delivery valve disc and pressure spring. And once you assemble them and torque them, you uh, check spray pattern and popping pressure, and then you put them in a comparator made by Backrack. When I went to school at Max A's, we had one of these. And what a comparator does, when you see the word 80, or the number 80, on uh, a Detroit unit injector, an old two-cycle two Detroit diesel or Jimmy, if when it says 80, what that means is that at full rack on a back rack test stand or comparative test stand, for every thousand strokes it will deliver 80 cc's. Now once they do the popping pressure and get them right and then they check the, the full fuel, full rack, 1,000, it counts them off and measures it in a calibrated cup. And based on that measurement they determine on a piece of paper that's the calibration of the injector, that's how many cc's per 1,000 strokes full rack that it delivers and they pick the numbers out of a little tray and they pull out the old numbers and pop the new ones in and smash them flat so when you see an injector that says 70 cc's that is 70 cc's per thousand strokes full fuel full rack position full fuel rack uh, 80 is 80 cc's they made 90's so if you've ever wondered what does that number stand for it's not the year of production it's not that it's the number of cc's per thousand strokes that that injector at full rack will deliver on a test stand in a calibrated cup. It has to be calibrated. And when you get there, there are parameters, you know, there are limitations high and low, but when you get a match set of injectors, if they've done them right, they should have pretty close to identical popping pressure and per thousand strokes the same number of cc's per thousand strokes. If you're not getting that, you're getting shitty injectors that were not calibrated on a test stand and they're not calibrated, they're junk. And you'd be amazed how many dirty people do stuff like that out there. Now on a Cummins PT cylindrical injector, you had type A's, type B's, type C's, type D's, type D top stop. Then you had your triple or NT88 or your triple four type injectors. And those actually had a hydraulic valve lifter with a spring in it. And when the fuel pressure, and it was adjustable through an acorn nut, and they made a 49 state step timing valve and a 50 state step timing valve, SDC valve. 
uh, they're adjustable. Most of them have to have a return line so that the disc will actually bleed pressure off the low side and work the plunger. At a specific pressure, usually around 70 psi, it will move the plunger and that controls a passage in an annulus groove for a hydraulic line that goes up to the head for the hydraulic injectors. The injectors are still mechanical but when you're at idle up to about 70 psi there's oil pressure to the injectors and they pump up and they fire early probably around 15 to 21 degrees before top dead center. This improves starting in cold weather, starting in warm weather and clears up and clears startup smoke very quickly. That's when you pour the fuel to a Cummins it will start to advance much quicker because there's less air in the cup and it will run out of room to compress and it will develop popping pressure exceeding the compression pressure inside the combustion chamber and it will start to inject. So you have to retard the timing. The first types Cummins that did that had variable rocker, rocker followers, cam followers, and they had a mechanical linkage with an air cylinder and a control mechanism which would use air pressure to move the cylinder on an eccentric rack and advance or retard the timing. And it worked and some people really say that's the best way but actually the triple fours or the NT88s were the best. Now they had plastic like spool sleeves on some of the triple fours. Change those out for the metal or brass ones if you can. Uh, the plastic ones work hard and they deteriorate and they start to leak and they can break. When the pressure gets to about 70 it cuts off that fuel flow or the oil flow to the injectors and they overcome as they compress and they squeeze the oil out and they have they have a metered little very microscopic small flat spot on them so they constantly bleed down a little bit this helps them bleed so it don't bust the injector or bend the push rod so they pretty much instantly will go back to the retarded timing that way when you pour the fuel to it now it's not over advanced so you don't have pre-ignition or kill the motor on the power out they'll actually pull down about 15 1400 rpm don't do that Never pull a Cummins, an old Cummins below 16, 1500 RPM at the absolute most. Uh, it's very bad. When you really crank the fuel to them, even after you flow the cups out with bigger holes in the metering orifice, when it's running about 1700 RPM and full pressure going to that cup, the amount of compression or force compressing on that injector pushrod tube is equivalent to about 3600 pounds of pressure. That's like balancing a car. Most cars aren't even 3,600 pounds on that little cylindrical tube called an injector push rod. That's asking a lot of the push rod. This is what causes bent push rods when you don't flow the cup out. If you want to know about that stuff, well, very few people do I really respect as being able to impress me, but performance power in Pennsylvania, the Cummins gurus in Chatsworth, Pennsylvania, I bought their book years ago on high performance Cummins engines and I actually was very impressed. Very few people can actually teach me something that would impress me because I usually know more than the guy I'm talking to. But they really impressed me. If you have anything on a Cummins you need to know, talk to them people. I forgot what the number is but you can find it on the internet. Uh, Pittsburgh Performance Power something like that in Chatsworth and they make the souped up Cummins engines with the high altitude turbo and the plasma coated pistons and all that neat stuff. They're experts. I learned a lot about Cummins engines that I didn't know just by reading their book. And I don't even know if they still have the book available, but it used to be. And that was that was in the infancy of the internet and you know you still ordered a lot of stuff by books and, and I like the old fashioned ways of doing things. They work just fine. But anyway what was today's video supposed to be about? Because it's never really a, turns out the way that I wanted it to. Uh, today's video was supposed to be more about Detroit's and about some more theory. Uh, you know, I'm getting older and, and I lose my train of thought on some things, so bear with me on this. Detroit diesels, like I said in one of my previous videos, they're made for boats and buses and stuff with a torque converter and things like that. And what it boils down to, you have a blower, and that is a mechanical driven roots type supercharger with what they call spiral lobes. So you get a more uniform flow other than just straight lobes. If the blower has good bearings and the gears are in good shape and they have to be timed, you know, they have to be timed because there's a cutout slot in the, in the gear 
on the splines where the drive and the driven gear go on to the rotor shafts. We have a set of timing marks. They have to be timed. You have to put them both on at the same time, take them both off at the same time. Don't try to do them one. You'll, you'll bend the pins in the shaft to the rotor lobes. When it's set up right, the seals are good and the bearings are good. There is no metal-to-metal -metal contact in a Detroit Roots-type supercharger. There is a small amount of end plate clearance. There is a small amount of rotor-to-case clearance. And there is clearance between the leading and trailing edge of the rotor lobes. And unless something foreign goes through it, they should never wear out. If they're worn out or gouged up, something has went through them. Or they're worn out and the timing has gotten off on them. Because the gears are pretty close cut gears and they maintain this rotor to rotor lobe clearance. And it's, it's not super tight but it's around probably 5 to 12 thousandths of an inch. Because it's aluminum and aluminum expands a lot when it heats up. And what that does is it creates enough positive pressure inside the blower box or the plenum area so that when the exhaust valves open there's more pressure inside the air box than there is residual exhaust gas inside the combustion chamber. So theoretically the air flows into the cylinder and flushes the exhaust gas out of the valves. Now four valve heads are supposed to have a different cam which holds the exhaust valves closed a little longer because they bleed off the pressure so quickly that you can actually get another five or six degrees of crankshaft rotation before the exhaust valve starts open. This gives a little bit more time for the pressure to push down on the piston and make horsepower and torque. Two valve heads actually hold a residual amount, a small residual amount of spent exhaust gases inside the chamber. Now to a point that's not bad because there's actually enough unburnt fuel in two cycle Detroit diesel exhaust to extract power out of. If you don't believe me, run the exhaust into the intake and watch the motor come flying right through the cylinder until it flies all apart. There's actually enough unburnt fuel in it that it, you can extract power out of it. Well, this will get you power and decrease fuel consumption, which is a good thing. It's actually like a naturally occurring, because of function, EGR, or exhaust gas recirculation. It stays inside the chamber. Four valve heads with a, a blower, a turbocharger, and your roots type blower tend to flush all that air out, which may make them cleaner for emissions, uh, make the EPA happy, but it will also kill just a touch of your fuel economy. Okay, what else was I going to talk about? The blower consumes a tremendous amount of power. They made different size blowers and they also made different drives, you know. Blowers always run about 20 to 35 percent more than the crankshaft speed. Because everything in a two-cycle Detroit or a Jimmy is one-to-one. -one. It's not two-to-one like a four-cycle engine. So the blower, even at 500 RPM, it's doing about 730 RPM. It's, it's moving. Don't ever get your fingers near it because it'll suck them right in and take them right off. Trust me. You better be very careful what you do when you mess around with these. Uh, my battery is starting to get weak. I should have charged it up more. But I'll charge it up and make another video uh, after I transfer this one and make a save. But the end result, for that reason, that, that's how it works. Now, there's another thing about a Detroit is they have two-piece pistons. They have a cast steel crown and a forged or cast aluminum skirt. And they have a sealing ring in between the two, and the wrist pin goes between it. Now, later model ones, the wrist pin actually bolted to the connecting rod. And I can't remember right off the top of my head if it functioned like the original ones that were the it had a split bearing inside the small end of the connecting rod and oil would go around it through a little squirter and cool the piston. It worked great. Detroit pistons, you can burn them up and you can crack them from pre-ignition, but the bottom line is they generally take quite a bit of heat, whereas an aluminum piston will melt at a much cooler temperature. Now we talked a little bit about short and long connecting rods. Long connecting rods, whether it be a V engine or a straight engine, and they're traditionally longer in a straight inline six type engine, they transmit more of the force to making torque and horsepower or spinning the crankshaft. Short connecting rods, you get a very steep angle where the connecting rod is like this, where a longer connecting rod is up more, and it's pushing down on the crank like this. With the shorter connecting rod, you're getting a lot of lateral thrust on your major or minor thrust faces. 
And the larger the piston skirt, the more that force is distributed out, it's dissipated, so it's less pounds per square inch. Uh, that's another reason why you can have some engines that are actually a little bit smaller, uh, different bore and stroke relationship, but actually make more torque and horsepower than a bigger cubic inch engine. That's one of the reasons why. Uh, before my battery goes dead, uh, we'll talk a little bit about a, a very novel engine that Cat had that, that took us pretty much where we are today for a very large part was the 1693. It was the first four and a quarter horsepower engine that Cat made for trucks. It was targeted for the trucking industry and they had it in construction equipment too. It was a dual overhead cam. All the timing gears were on the back end. Uh, it was it was a morphodite. It was years ahead of its time. Uh, it had an after cooler. It was one you could unscrew the adapter and put a pinnel type injection nozzle in it into a pre-combustion chamber. The adapter was either a sleeve or a pre-combustion chamber. Pre-combustion chambers transfer all that heat right in directly into the water in the head, head circulation passages. So pre-combustion chambers heat the water pretty good. They can have some cooling problems with them. Pre-combustion chambers, when the fuel squirts into it, it's inside of a ball of blistering hot fire. It vaporizes the fuel instantly, starts to mix with oxygen molecules, and immediately ignite and burn. But it makes smooth power. And so there's different torque and horsepower characteristics on a pre-combustion chamber. If you look at your modern engines, they don't have pre-combustion chambers, but they're direct injection. They have roller cams, stuff like that, one long cylinder head. The CAT 1693 pioneered that back in the 70s. And it really scared mechanics. They didn't know how to work on it. You had to take a number two Phillips screwdriver and stick it into the, the followers over the valve springs. And there was a clicker adjustment where you could adjust it. The second part is that the drive on the system ran the gear on the camshaft. And at the end of that was a gear mated to another gear which run it. Well, if you apply torque to a shaft, it will twist. You'll get deflection. The longer the shaft, the more deflection. To, to counteract that, they make them bigger, but you can only make them so big within design limitations. If you're starting at the front and it, you're losing because there's a load on it from the valve springs and the followers, and that develops, it takes a lot of force and it develops twist on the shaft, then it goes through the gears and comes all the way back to the other end. So the very last cylinder on its valves, there could be 5 to 10 degrees, maybe even 12 of difference in the valve timing events because of such a design. It was a good engine, made out of good, but that was a design limitation that was probably wasn't the greatest. The problem is engineers only have so much time to do this and they don't give them a tremendous amount of time to fine-tune the design. So anytime you're dealing with something like that, you'll never notice that at idle. But at say 1600 RPM, when you're cranking it, when it's when the motor's running, there could be, there's going to be two or three degrees of flex here, go through the gears all the way at the other end, the other shaft would be another two or three degrees. This causes your valve timing to not be in sync with the crankshaft, and that will actually detract from power on one cylinder. The engine might have been able to make 460 horsepower, but it only could get 20, 425 because of differences in valve timing events because of twisting due to torque. And the long, there were long shafts, it was a straight six engine. But it took us in places where we probably wouldn't be today. It was very innovative. It was years ahead of its time. It scared people. All other engines had, you know, uh, an injector that went in on the outside of the head or in the center of the head. But it had push rods and the cam was in the block. This was completely unique. If you look at most of your modern engines, your ISX, your C15s, 34-6Es, there are a lot of similarities between them and the 1693 CAT. The injection pump was on the odd side. Uh, it, it was a very different engine, and it could be direct or pre-combustion chamber, had an after-cooler, turbo. Uh, it was a very novel engine, same bore and stroke as your 3406 Bs, A, Bs, and Cs, and as, if I'm not mistaken, your 3406 Cs and your C15s, six and a half inch strokes, real torque motor. And it, and it took us places, and you need to give that engine credit. Uh, in my next video, I think I'm going to talk about some Cummins injector timing and stroke and also on your Detroits but I'm gonna have to end this video now because it's gonna take a while to upload and I gotta charge my phone up it's not really where I wanted to go with this video but bear with me you know you'll absorb this knowledge and one day you'll be grateful that you did
So we'll see you again. Okay, take care. See you tomorrow or the next day or whenever I get around to it. Bye.